Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining the Great Dynamics Podcast. My name is Ahmed Hassan, and with me today, as always, a very interesting guest and a friend. Today with me is Christoph Stegemann. Christoph is a former human intern in the German Bundeswehr. Actually, he used to lead the human school in the German army, and he worked across the German IC. And since 2019, he is retired, and he's in a private sector, and he's available for all kinds of contracts. Hi, Christoph. Hello, Ahmed. Uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, having me. And uh, congratulations to your to your podcast and, uh, of course, to, to all the other work. That's uh, one of my greatest wishes to, to uh, join you in your podcast. And, uh, oh, wow. Yeah, say maybe thank something you so much. Uh, on it. Uh, yeah. So well, thank you. Yeah, good too that we uh, that we could make it happen. I've been I've been meaning to talk to you for a long time, as you know. To maybe some of the listeners that do not know, we we had a, an addition to the family, and um, so my whole summer was upside down. And uh, one of the reasons why there was no podcast episodes. But yeah, really glad to to pick it back up and and have somebody as interesting as you uh, joining us. I think you're the second German. After Ole, um, who I think you also know, how did you how did you get into this? Oh, uh, you you mean in the in the intelligence world? Yeah, yeah. How did how how did your career in that start? Yeah, yeah. I, I think it was uh, the classical uh, small boy or young boy joins the army and sees the world and immediately uh, finds a place where he can can use his curiosity. Uh, his his uh, creativity and uh, also I have maybe a knack for languages to to yeah to meet other other humans to to talk to them to understand them and so that's basically how it started out I I started with the German military uh, was an ordinary German tank uh, officer candidate and then my first mission abroad uh, happened uh, in this time in 2004. It was Afghanistan, and uh, there I I was immediately taken by this multinational uh, environment and uh, all the dynamics that happened in in Afghanistan there, and uh, that's yeah what what got me into Intel, meeting immediately Intel types and admiring them for their work and their knowledge, and their uh, and their and their wisdom in a way and and their advice, and that's how I joined Intel in my first Afghanistan mission, one of four. So when when you go in as a as a tank commander, what's how does that process look like? Do you ask or are you asked to to join the intelligence corps? Uh, yeah, in a way. Uh, in in the past, um, the the German uh, uh, military forces were still in the process of transforming from that uh, let's say Cold War uh, territorial uh, military forces to the. To the mission oriented forces capable of of deploy out outside of Europe outside of Germany, so there was no real dedicated intelligence corps at that time but um actually you were you were seconded by your by your branches uh, into that uh, and um i I met inspiring young and and old um, officer comrades and uh, they actually asked me, hey you like languages, uh, you are a young curious individual uh, come join us and then you have to to apply. And there was also some kind of um, selection process you have to go through. Um, and then uh, after I uh, went back, after nearly seven months, I, I returned to, to Germany and then I applied for, for this intelligence function and I was chosen and uh, that's how I joined it. So actually, I, to be honest, I learned a lot of the trade, even if, if uh, I wasn't actually a, a real member and, and I wasn't really trained. I learned a lot on the job and that maybe fascinated me from the beginning just and then from that point that you join how do you then decide that human is the direction that you want to go into so you said you're interested in people like how does that pathway look like yeah uh, thanks for the question that that actually happened uh, all in those seven months of my of my first mission in in afghanistan um, I started out actually as as the the S two officer of the the German battalion group at that time, 
And um, my my first responsibilities were, of course, uh, guards and fences and all that, let's say, physical, uh, more physical orientated uh, security stuff. And uh, but but uh, very fast, um, I realized that uh, interacting with the Afghans and also with other nationalities um, was was my way of of doing work. And uh, also, I speak English, French, Russian, and some other languages that helped me a lot. And then therefore, it was natural that uh, I I quickly got also other tasks like uh, liaising with Afghans, for example, or with the uh, New Zealanders or French or Canadian. And then I. Uh, met some some german and also some some other uh, some other national um, or nations from the intelligence um, world and they they immediately spotted me so it's it's a little bit like uh, with the, all the movies where you were spotted by someone and someone approaches you and says hey you got capabilities we can develop for human intelligence think about it and uh, give us a call and <laughs> that's actually how how i then went into human and from that point, because it's something I'm, I'm really interested in. Obviously, you and I talked about this before, but the the difference in in maybe culture and approach. Um, would you say that when you met in in other deployments, uh, when you look at other maybe NATO countries or non NATO countries, how does the German way of doing human or intelligence in general differ does it differ that's also a very interesting question and uh, it took me some time also to to realize it for myself or maybe i'm just uh, explaining it uh, this way for myself in in my understanding and in my experience there is a difference um, um i let's say was introduced into this world by uh, also by germans but but also by other uh, other nationals, um, like for example, I had a very good Dutch human master. I worked for in 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 Kabul in Afghanistan, and um, also I had a Danish guy and a Norwegian guy who who influenced me uh, in this way. And um, I would say there there is a difference in a let's say the the Nordics, the Dutch, the German, the Austrian way, which is in my understanding a bit more oriented on the level of that uh, between the handler and the source it's some more a kind of partnership more a, a kind of equal partnership um, whereas for example i participated in i was invited to to join for example american or also british uh, exercises uh, also for deployments to iraq and to other places and there was there was a much more let's say um, process orientated thing so for example um, I, w I would say the maybe the British American way is much more information oriented, and uh, a little less on the on the partnership level, whereas the the let's call it Dutch German Nordic way is is more about the partnership and the, of course also information, but uh, there's a different I think priority. I I saw and see it still this way, so that's the basic difference like like i said i had the chance to participate in american exercises also in, in british ones and uh, i also did some international training by myself but also participated in international training and and there were differences there were differences in in how handlers how human intelligence handlers or operators um approached uh, things and worked with sources and um when you're in a mission and uh, it rarely happens but it happens that you take over sources from other nas uh, nationalities um there were also uh, differences but very very interesting so i, I also Absolutely. learned a lot yeah no i can imagine so from from your time in then how long does it take before you start like that you were appointed the the head of the human school like how how long were you in that in that space oh that <laughs> that took six 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 seven years at, at least so and and to be to be realistic and to be to be honest uh, uh, you you have to learn the trade and um, of course in in the military offices are usually let's say for leading and making decisions and so on but uh, even as a, as an officer you you have to to know know your trade so I naturally went through the position of, of operator, of team leader. I also headed and managed um, whole human intelligence, let's say humans, uh, units. And um, 
if you do this in different settings, um, I served in Afghanistan and Bosnia and Kosovo. <laughs> I've been to Iraq, to all the romantic vacation spots and um, the, the army has to offer. And um, also had a lot of um, contact, for example, with the NATO Center for, for Human, uh, Human Intelligence, uh, Center of Excellence. Uh, and also had the different chances to participate with other nations in their human work. And after all this, then I felt a bit more qualified to, to do this because um, maybe one speciality in German human intelligence, um, you are trained uh, twofold. You are trained uh, as a human source handler in, in, let's say, elicitation, but you are also trained in the German army, and that's the original task, as an interrogator. And uh, so it's, uh, in my understanding, it was and it is still today very vital that you are, let's say, uh, versed in, in, in both areas. And, and they are completely different. Yeah. Everybody yeah, no. knows this, so... Yeah. No, it's very interesting because if you look at, for example, in the UK or in some other you know, in some other countries, there's a very clear delineation between the two. You either become agent handler or interrogator. Um, so it's interesting that you get trained to, to do both things. Is that just pure efficiency, German efficiency, or is that because there's not that many people to do it and it's not that big of a function? Yeah, it's uh, you. You hit it. it it's a. Uh, it's a uh, bit of both, and there's also a third element. Uh, historically, the let's say the human intelligence branch, which is which is nowadays, um, in in the past they were uh, they were on their own, but now they are part of the army reconnaissance corps, and uh, in the past they were uh, made up uh, mostly of reservists, and those reservists uh, they uh, so so part time soldiers. And then they were trained in all the foreign languages that were that were needed, and yeah, were were used in the primary role as um, interrogators. And they didn't cost the army much. They they weren't on the payroll, and that's so that's the historical explanation because uh, or how everyone starts out as a as an interrogator and then qualifies uh, in the elicitation uh, uh, area. How did how have you seen it changes through through? The war on terror to German military intelligence. Is there a change? Is there a way after Iraq, Afghanistan, lessons learned? Have you seen a culture change? Have you seen a systematic change? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And I think the this change is still, uh, of course, obviously, it, it is on, ongoing again. Um, as, as I started out in, uh, in intelligence, in the intelligence world, um, mostly in the military one, We were still in that transition from from this Cold War. We are waiting for the Russians to cross the border to to doing things um, in in Bosnia or in in Afghanistan. And the whole, let's say, the whole uh, set uh, of information and the whole influx of information was totally different. And uh, we we actually had to learn and very fast that a lot of information we weren't aware was outside was now really important. And um, the the maybe the the older stuff counting tanks and looking for planes and how many armed groups uh, or how many members has an armed group, something like this, was maybe a little bit less important than uh, the 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 mood of the populace or the different tribes and their intentions and so on, which could which which did influence your mission and, and your your existence in those in those missions. So that's something that changed I think everyone a lot. Um, we got much also much more technology uh, let's say interested. But I think from from my generation and from my friends who are still in the military, we, we would characterize ourselves and our generation. We are technology interested, but we do not, uh, let's say, immerse so much in technology that we uh, forget all the, let's say, analog uh, capabilities. That's something which can be seen today. That, for example, if you talk to an intelligence professional today, He's 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 a god in open source intelligence or in social media intelligence, but uh, sometimes you 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 have to remind them, hey guys, not uh, everything is written uh, on a blog, on LinkedIn or on Instagram. A lot of stuff happens outside, which is not digitized and recorded. So, and this is sometimes the important stuff. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, no, and, the, the, sorry to interrupt you, Christoph, but the funny thing that you say because I've been saying this for a while, but I've I've tried to be kinder to the OSINT community and I have nothing against them it's just when I, I mean you and I talked about this also before but 
I completely agree with what you're saying and I would just wish sometimes we spoke the same language and we don't and that's also why we are doing the things that we're doing and we're doing this podcast uh, because I do think that they do amazing work it's just uh, we need to see it in it's not what is it uh, the silver bullets as it yeah. were and, and maybe to give uh, let's say a keyword maybe for for the later part of, of our chat that is something that is much much more important in the civilian in the corporate world to to uh, decide what you do to do this kind uh, the part of direction if we are referring to the inter cycle uh, so but maybe just another thing um, i also teach i'm also a lecturer for some state uh, agencies and uh, concerning intelligence but also uh, especially human intelligence and there it is the same the the new uh, the new spies or the new handlers so to say they they are very uh, technology technological uh, able uh, they can do amazing things but you really have to to talk and to to teach more some some basic social interaction stuff that's something i see the last years and i'm still um supporting them and then teaching sometimes lesson and then doing even some some exercises for them that is that is more yeah that is more more needed uh, these days the, the basic stuff but yeah do you think that uh, the rise of of technology and growing up with technology for the younger generation is a detriment to the lack of social skills could be i don't know uh, to to be honest as a other father myself uh, i sometimes um, i'm not so uh, happy with the, how much time my my kids uh, spend with their mobile devices or spend online uh, but uh, yeah it, it could be it could be connected uh, but maybe you you know as well uh, Humans are different. Some have more of it. Some have more of the capabilities, or they are, let's say, better trained or better, better existing than than others. So, yeah. But but there is ob there is a truth in this. Yeah, definitely. No, because we ha we had a discussion in the team about this yesterday. That uh, there was one misconception that we talked about, which people think that humans are often extroverts, but in reality, they're mainly introverts. And and research says that, that that's the case. Well, what is your opinion on that? I would like to hear your... <laughs> ah, I, I, I agree. And uh, I would add to this that, uh, yeah, humans are, are introverts, but they they know, let's say, when they have to perform. They They know when they have to play a role or be themselves. Sometimes hard to... <laughs> <laughs> to do those uh, things, but um, they know when to be a certain person or personality, and uh, maybe that's sometimes the the maybe a misconception that you are then uh, uh, seen as someone very extrovert, but in in yeah in reality you are just doing your job. Yeah, fair enough. Like I agree with you on that. When you make the transition, or you did the civilian work. How is how does civilian human differ from the military? In your opinion? Oh yeah, that's that's also a, a very good question. Uh, in uh, I I say in the, the the basic principles, they are the same. Obviously, uh, when you do it for uh, let's say a state uh, agency, uh, human intelligence, you have a lot of um, or you have in in my experience, you have more information to. Uh, refine your approach usually in human intelligence you have one approach and then you make it or you break it the in, in building a connection to someone or creating a link and um, on the state side usually time is not so much and and other resources like financial resources are not so much issues uh, of course as in the civilian world and uh, also the the capability to use restricted information about an individual to understand more her or his life that's something you are missing in the civilian world so and uh, uh, but to be honest in the civilian world very often the level of of detail of information that's required is maybe not so intense or no not not so let's say not so big like uh, like in the state world but uh, it is a different approach 
and usually you are on your own and uh, the backup for example is is not existed <laughs> in the civilian uh, world yeah and i mean we we talked about it just before the the recording started but how does stricter privacy laws impact that Oh, I think it's uh, it's uh, the the impact, but I think it's also a question of um, how you approach the subject. For example, um, I try to to do a lot of stuff in the civilian world as common, easy information chats, something like this, in so that you you uh, never got got in danger of of overstepping the law or harassing someone or something like this. I think this is something in in the corporate uh, world um, and especially in the let's say in the in the free security world uh, outside of a corporation where you have to be very creative to to achieve your your aims um because without uh, rules without badges without processes without let's say hierarchy like in a big company yeah you you have to you have to be creative to to get access to someone And I think this is uh, this is one of the challenges, one of the main challenges you you have to adapt to. Yeah, because there's something that um, I get questions from from a lot of guys that either are on the way out, on the transitioning out of a government job into a private sector, or they're just out, and they they ask me like, you know, how do I set up? How do I work? How do I you know? How do I engage with clients? And what I find fascinating, and this is a conversation I think you will probably had many times too, is that when you are out, you're out. The networks that you build, the countries that you visit, those are, you cannot use them because all the sources that you made, they don't belong to you, they belong to the state. And even if they still belong to you, they don't even know who you really are. Right, so it's not like you can go back on your real name, and you know, and if you go, that's not that's not how I remember it. So, can you give like a little bit of your insights in when you made that transition? How would you go about building that network back up again? And is that is that client driven that you built the network, or is that in your in your eyes interest driven from yourself or areas you want to work in? I know it's a bit of a complex question, but. Oh, thank you very much for <laughs> pointing this out. <laughs> no, no, all good, all good. The the question, yeah, but the question is really fascinating, and uh, that is actually something I was um, thinking uh, some some time ago uh, about exactly this. Um, to to uh, make a small confession, maybe, of course, you are out when you are out, but. Uh, Some connections uh, still exist to, let's say, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I still have a lot of friends who are, let's say, in the business and I can approach them. But that's also something um, you said, it's bad tradecraft. If you, if you let's say, reach out to, to sources who knew you from a different perspective, it's bad tradecraft. And um, I would also say it's a breach of, of, of trust um, with those sources because they work usually with you. As uh, as an agreement of of confidentiality, of of security, of protecting them because they help you in, in their capabilities, and uh, so that would be something I would I would never do and never advise, and therefore it's it's out of the question. But to maybe get back to your to your question, of course there are still some some networks existing, and I find it fascinating. For example, that in for coming from the civilian from the commercial perspective uh, a lot of training for example or a lot of technological help can be can be let's say given back to to your former life and to your uh, former uh, uh, agencies um, but also to uh, think about how you go on when you leave um, that is something i found out is is better for me in uh, doing it uh, interest driven from myself in the beginning, apart from you are really gifted or you are lucky, uh, there are usually not so many clients and not so many, let's say, uh, tasks you can work on. So you have to to think uh, which do you approach as uh, your clients. And therefore, it's good to have a network already in place or to have capabilities already in place, uh, which you can use. And I found out that it's good if you have, uh, let's say, general knowledge of a lot of topics, for example, But to uh, uh, define yourself um, via your your real speciality—that's how I position myself. And that 
that's that's difficult in the human uh, in the human realm, so to say, because um, human is not a capability you need every day, in comparison maybe to to open source intelligence. But if you are able to to present uh, and also do very good work, that you are maybe the specialist for human intelligence work in an area. That's something I strive for. That's something I made good progress. And that's maybe a way to, to position yourself. But the way to, to, let's say, this goal is usually uh, leathered with uh, a lot of, yeah, talking to people in the knowledge that there will be no, no business coming out of it, but building up a connection, keeping the connection. It's, it's a lot of um, time you spend just talking to people to, to know what uh, they need or what they feel. And this helps you usually in the, in the later part. If that makes sense any sense and answer your no, question. No, it does. It does. No, no, it does because I think and the, the proactive nature that you have to, or stance that you have to have, I mean, I completely agree with you. I think when I went into this understanding like what's the most valuable area to go into and I tried different avenues, you know, is it hard security, counterterrorism still or is it, you know, commercial uh, and I think finding your niche as it were you know, that determines how you continue to build your network in that space. So I think that's, and at least that's my uh, perspective on it. Maybe, maybe that's I'm also a useful quote. Um, I, I used to, to uh, I also was uh, with a military a teacher about intelligence, and I, I said to my, my students usually, you don't have to know everything, but as a good human intelligence guy or girl, you have to know who to ask. And sometimes uh, the the information or the need is just a telephone call or a physical conversation away. And if you have if you embrace this kind of mindset, then you are usually very good in your in your function. Yeah, yeah. No, I think there's something that that I think I wanted to like transition into. Now you're on the private sector and how that works. And and particularly, I'm I'm, I'm very keenly interested in the German private sector because I think people that do not understand Germany or German society in, in general, I think they wouldn't get it. But before we do that, there's something that I wanted to ask you because I mentioned this to you before. You did something very unique, or at least um, you tried to do something very unique in the sports intelligence space. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, of course. Um, that uh, that was a really unique project. And uh, To be honest, this lured me out of government service. Actually, I was um, approached if if I would be interested, and the company uh, thought uh, I'm I'm the perfect fit for them to uh, support sports in uh, gathering information and making intelligence out of it to fight uh, doping to fight doping in sport, and uh, this is something which has reached and and still is at at levels we can hardly understand what what uh, athletes and also but also what trainers and coaches do to athletes with substances which are extremely shady and harmful yeah to to achieve results and to win medals and uh, a company uh, a swiss one uh, actually who's, who's also very much in the in the sports betting game so so they knew which uh, also kind of um, not so good effects The, the sports industry has, yes. they uh, got a contract and they made some kind of uh, first-time project and try to uh, combine different uh, information and also intelligence gathering methods to fuse it all together and uh, try to make sports cleaner and try to find out those athletes who do a certain kind of training at a certain place, take a certain substances and so on. So And, and uh, to be maybe a little bit more detailed um yeah actually we we built up a department um, with OSINT and social media analysts we had um also some some access to to medical files and to medical experts to to even uh, doping labs so so laboratories who analyzed um substances which were on the market which were uh which were seized by police and so on And uh, we also did a lot of looking on the market and also on the black market and the dark net, which kind of substances were, were offered and so on. And of course, there was this uh, whistleblower slash human source 
approach to to look out for them and to talk to them and uh, that was obviously my part i was contracted for and then this project um, started and it was very fascinating and um it worked i was i was astonished how much doping there is and i was also astonished about the level and the level of sophistication which is done for example there in in, in some there are there are facilities uh, which uh, let's say um, where, where you can simulate um, different uh, height levels so for example you can sleep in a room and live in a house which emulates um, 6000 uh, feet uh, elevation so your body reacts to this and of course who is more medically worst your red blood cells growth is enhanced and so on and you are just you can just uh, <laughs> deliver more, more more power and and something like this and uh, that was that were uh, let's say methods who were who were gray and sometimes forbidden and um, that's maybe on the more detailed side and to to find this out yeah you have to, to talk to people you have to talk to people you you get indi of course you are got indications in the data you get indications in the medical files and to be uh, to be honest it's also maybe a little bit um, questionable how much data um, sports athletes have to provide by themselves to take part so that's also something we usually don't know that they have to lock every every place where they will be to lock everything they take to give a lot of blood and other uh, body fluids so this is something i wasn't aware that uh, this is necessary and uh, but to to fuse it all together and um, try to to come up with intelligence and prevent forbidden forbidden actions and the use of forbidden substances that was really fascinating two years to just yeah, give can, you a glimpse yeah no i can imagine no, it's it's uh you mentioned earlier like if you would uh, if you would have to like specialize in an area like for me personally it's I haven't really done my best to do it to be honest with you but because I kind of like fell into certain things but like sports intelligence and, and, and understanding or helping clubs particularly in football and these kind of sports I would find fascinating to do I haven't really done it but uh, that's an area that I think I would really enjoy I mean, I think it's it's a lot nicer than looking at very dangerous people that want to do dangerous things. I mean, yeah, of to me at least, you know, it's. Uh, um, I, I think it's also a bit in different, you know, and um, as something that yeah, on a personal level I would enjoy more. But so for you now in the private sector, I mentioned earlier about the um, the German culture and 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 German industry. How does the German private intelligence space look like today? Yeah, <laughs> thank you for that question. Uh, all over the world, Germans are usually uh, seen as efficient and uh, straight people. And uh, of course, we don't have any humor. But uh, uh, in in the security and in the, let's say, in the corporate security and also in the corporate intelligence world, the, the Germans are latecomers. We are we are really really late comers, a long long time in uh, all connecting security and industry was yeah it was guards fence and maybe uh, fire prevention something like this, but uh, also in the German uh, uh, corporate world now it's uh, it's useful if you know who you are dealing with uh, it's useful to know who is applying for you with a job and it's of course uh, useful to know um, how certain developments can or could uh, influence your your business so business continuity stuff and so on and uh, so like i said germany was a latecomer therefore in the german of course uh, the the big german companies they now have they now have the corporate security um, parts uh, and they don't do only close protection and uh, car prototype protection and intellectual property protection they they do as well now um business intelligence um, and so on but um apart from that there are there are some some i would call them smaller um boutique companies um some consultancies they are they are on the market for for quite some time some of them and uh, there are good ones there are not so good ones but i think germany has adapted in the last 
10, 15 years to, to the international market. And uh, to be direct and, and honest, um, we, we uh, took a lot from, from the UK to develop in, in that sector. But, and of course, there are a lot of freelance uh, individuals. Uh, some have specialities, some not, um, and uh, who support. And uh, of course, also due to accessibility and to to uh, uh, maybe also the factor that it's more attracting, also in social media intelligence, uh, that is something you you can get very easily. But specialized um, specialized stuff, for example, that's maybe a handful of of companies who do especially the the non Olsen stuff or who are capable of doing things like that and maybe one another part um especially for the human intelligence um people um a lot of work is coming from investigations from talking to whistleblowers from talking to internal sources or former employees or something like this to then support clients in in dealing with the issues that's that's and, and also from the penetration test side um, to do physical penetration testing, to do social engineering, that's that's the stuff that works also in the German, let's say, industry, or the German industry area for uh, human intelligence uh, orientated individuals. I think uh, there may be a slightly outside of the realm of, of private intelligence or what I'm, what I'm really interested in, how do you think the reprioritization of like the UK in war impacted German intelligence and German maybe security mindset um, because we talked about going from Cold War to, to war on terror and now it seems like we're going backwards to some hybrid form of Cold War and, 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 and war or proxy wars yeah that that is actually something which which I also can feel in the in the German industry and I would uh, would uh, go as as this far and divide it a little bit maybe I think on the in the in the IT uh, uh, sector and the cyber sector this this kind of situation exists all the time and maybe they are a little bit uh, more at the forefront uh, in in thinking and in transforming but um in the let's say classical corporate security um, this is something that, um, yeah, wasn't was was not so important in the past. Um, for example, the the classic uh, Cold War stuff in um, looking uh, who's applying for a job with you, doing a background checks, doing uh, uh, checks on on your business partners, on suppliers, on vendors. That is something which was was a long time out of fashion, and of course there were no resources and no no. Uh, no time invested in it, and which which is now coming back, and which is now coming back at, at a very fast pace. For example, I had a client who works in the in the energy uh, sector, and they, for example, have now not only in Germany but also it's a global uh, uh, company. They have a lot of places where they have state restrictions on uh, who can work for them, and and on let's say security issues connected with the background. And that is stuff, uh, if you have talked to me about this five years ago, I would have said uh, no issue today. But uh, with the, 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 the war in Europe, um, that, is, that has changed. And of course, it's new business opportunities. To, that is something that, which is correct as well. So, so, so a lot of the, the, let's say, classical counterintelligence stuff is, is coming back. And uh, there's a lot of companies where it's not existing. Not even the mindset, apart from from processes or apart from from uh, measures against it. Well, because uh, what I find fascinating also is that I have German friends that work in in, in the corporate security, corporate intelligence, and sometimes you know I think they 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 lose really good people to foreign companies because the language between what the the person that is trying to like warn or, or trying to implement. And the corporate management doesn't really align. And um, do you see that there, there's a shift happening there, or do you maybe a more ambitious question here? But what do you think the solution for that should be? Oh yeah, that, that is uh, again a very interesting question. Thank you. Um, 
Yeah, I think it's changing. This um, I, I saw this as well. That, for example, the the chief uh, security officer in a German company, um, regardless if it's a if it's a medium sized or a, or a big player, in the past um, the the CSO and his his organization wasn't so important and was not on board level. That changed because even the the German industry was affected by by uh, issues who were not known before. So, for example, um, personal tr uh, threats against uh, one of the of the board leaders of uh, a German yeah, military goods uh, producer. That's something corporate security has to deal now uh, with and, and deal against it. And uh, those were the incidents who changed the, the importance but also the perception of intelligence. Um, or of corporate security in in a big company, even in a German company, and um, also with the non-state, let's say, related things like uh, the, the the a lot of knowledge uh, involuntarily transfer. I would call it a lot of uh, espionage, for example, of of uh, knowledge. That is something uh, which needs to be addressed in the for the sake of the company, because otherwise the company is, is going bankrupt if they are not doing uh, something against it. Uh, those are issues which uh, which um, uh, came forward, and therefore, of course, um, supported the the corporate security organization. And uh, this is something um, which which is much more important right now. And uh, we're also, to be precise. Um, corporate security had the chance to present themselves as a as a valid contributor to the to the company results to the company existence, and this is something which is uh, now also uh, also uh, happening in Germany, and which is good, which is good for the company, but also good for the industry. Since you had a very interesting uh, career so far, what would you give advice to? Uh, I know Germany might be different than than places elsewhere people I think Germany is very similar to continental Europe uh, like to the Netherlands and the Nordics uh, mindset wise but uh, what advice would you give young people that are that are trying to get into this industry either or state or private side yeah I think nowadays it's uh, much better than maybe 10 years ago um, especially in Germany, as as we are latecomers in some in some areas, we are also latecomers in, in uh, security and in, in, in corporate security management and education. For example, since some years ago, there were no real German uh, uh, master degrees uh, or even bachelors available in, in this kind of uh, field on German university. But this changed. So, regardless, if you if you are coming fresh from university or if you are leaving, for example, the state service. I would advise, and it was good for me to join a bigger company, maybe a consultant company. All the big consulting companies, they have um, intelligence teams, they have forensics and, and anti-fraud teams and so on. So big four, maybe a good stop to, to learn two years there how the industry is is working, that it's much more fast-paced, that uh, but it, it's much more uh, not so detail-interested to, to certain parts. For example, if I remember my... My supervisor in the in the intelligence service, uh, when he was reading my reports, sometimes he's, yeah, we were crawling about every word. <laughs> that's uh, that's uh, something uh, which should be good, of course, in, in the corporate world. You're you're reporting because that's the the result of your work. But uh, I never had uh, to to uh, quarrel of to to yeah talk about specific words. So that's maybe something you uh, you have to adapt to to to. Um, work much faster um, so maybe go to go to a consulting company if it's uh, one of the big four or big fives if it's one of it's a special consultancy security consultancy go there learn for two to three to four years maybe stay there if you like it but after you get the the touch how things are run in, in corporate do your own stuff or join join another uh, maybe more specialized uh, company or go overseas. That's also something I knew a lot of guys, especially in the close protection world, where they they trained a little bit of of uh, in in with civilian uh, training companies, and then they went overseas for four, five, six, seven years, and then they returned and uh, went more in the consulting and training area than being the the 
let's say lead uh, close protection guy. So, so that would be an idea. But um, I strongly suggest feel out how the industry is working. It's it's different from definitely from university, and it is definitely different from from government service. On on the on the government side, what well, what would you tell people to uh, to do? Yeah, it's, yeah. Thank you for that. Um, may, maybe I'm a, a little bit a bad example because um, actually I turned down two times uh, life employment by the state to do something else. Even some of my friends uh, could not understand why I leave the security and safety of the state. But um, believe in yourself, and if you don't feel comfortable. And uh, I did not at some parts of my life. And therefore, I made decisions. Um, do. Make make decisions. Do it. If it's the wrong one, no problem. Then correct it. And do something else. But um, decide and uh, be be active. Control your own fate. That's, that's something I would... Uh, and, and there is a life after government. There is a life after intelligence service, believe me. You don't have to do this <laughs> until, until you fade in the gray like all the old spies. So um, it's, it is possible. But think, decide, and then act. Good point. So we like to always ask people that uh, come on the podcast... Um, is it gun gave us any cultural recommendations? You know, what are you watching? What are you listening to? What are you reading? So, from your perspective, Christoph, as a as a former German intelligence officer, yeah, what what do you do in your free time? What do you watch? What do you read? Yeah, uh, I have to, I have to confess, I I divided a little bit. There's let's say uh, my my subject uh, orientated uh, human intelligence stuff. I try to to stay with the with the development but also i have some some leisure time but on the maybe on the on the human intelligence matter i'm a, i'm a great fan of uh called uh, uh, walton's uh, book spies um i i like the the compressed uh, overview of of uh, the soviet activities and also of the activities in the in the intelligence world that was for my liking. It was a very good condensed mix of of um, all this time, and um, maybe if someone wants to to look in the more in the technical aspects, so to say, of human intelligence, I uh, read a book and I also used it uh, to to be <laughs> to be honest for some of my lectures about human intelligence. Um, it's called The Recruiter by uh, Douglas London. It's um, he's a he's a CIA, he was actually a CIA agent recruiter. He was a CIA case officer, and um, he wrote down his life, who he re recruited um, agents and, and and prospective agents and so on. That, from the technical point of view, I find very good and very precise. There you can uh, learn a lot about the tradecraft. It's in in my perception, sadly. Usually books um, in this uh, subject uh, or in this topic, they are memoirs. So I'm still looking for the one of the technical, uh, more technical books to, to explain how a human works. And, and there is methodology behind it, obviously behind human. And uh, that's something I teach in my, in my lecture at the university. Can I give um, you one? That yeah, of course. A technical one. So uh, it's called Orbit. It yeah. talks about the orbit method of okay. um, of information retrieval. I think you will like it. Cool, uh, thank um, you very much. Yeah, and then there's an older one. I think it's written by a former uh, Met police officer. I think uh, I think it's called Confidential Informants, um, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Um, and he talks a lot about techniques and. Um, yeah. Cool. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, on the and and of course on the on the interrogation side, um, um, I I still like the book The Interrogators from uh, Chris McKay and Greg Miller. I think in two thousand four uh, it was published, uh, and uh, that was actually something that that helped also us a lot in the in the development of of um, uh, the interrogation approaches um, in the military. So and as a classic, of course, books. For for leisure, I have to say I I very much like to to read John Le Carré. I had the uh, 
I had the privilege to to meet him. Uh, he is also connections to Germany, and I had the pri privilege to to meet him and to attend a, a reading of um, his latest book. Uh, it was also a smaller circle of intelligence professionals and former pr intelligence professionals he was reading to. So, so I, I like him also as a as a person. So Legacy of Spies, for example, is is an autumn classic where I wind down. Yeah, no, it's uh, I can uh, I, I mean I, I mean obviously James Bond uh, is is known, but I think John Le Carre's books are um, up there with the best of them. I think, uh, but um, any podcasts, any series, yeah, of course, of, yeah. of, of course, the Great Dynamics podcast. I I hey, very much you like go. your <laughs> your selection. Yeah, it's it's yeah. absolutely great. You you are able to to attract uh, individuals. From from Australia, from from the Americas, from Europe. That's uh, and I call myself a, a vivid observer of, let's say, the scene, the intelligence scene, and also the intelligence media scene. That's something you stay out with uh, those, and also with those different um, experts of intelligence uh, uh, disciplines. So you you had someone from. Uh, Uh, electronic intelligence or from signals intelligence you have human guys you have and that's and that it's great and uh, also i like to to listen to your different guests but also on the of course i'm i'm a big fan of of british uh series well, slow horses is a is an absolute classic and and also there's an older one um i also like the spooks as uh, uh of course there was a lot of dramatization and so on but uh so so british uh, uh series i i like and and also fauda is, is uh, was at his time interesting but uh, yeah this but it's the same with me like with you as a as a uh, entrepreneur you have uh, you have to invest time in your business and then comes your family and then usually it's not much left so yeah <laughs> yeah no, don't let my wife hear that one uh it's a bit but i think <laughs> I think there is a good balance to be made. Um, and I think also, like, I don't, I don't know if you teach elements of counterintelligence, but I, I don't know why I've never mentioned this, but there is a book uh, called uh, Counterintelligence Theory and Practice. Uh, it's written by an Aussie, Hank Punken. Uh, awesome, awesome guy. Um, as, a, as a person, as well as a research, I think the best book on counter in Sabbath intelligence period. Well, thank you very and much. Also very technical, talks about methodologies, talks about different different uh, industries and and institutions on how they see counterintelligence. And I think he's like the first guy that broke it down into a theoretical framework. Common thoughts. So. Yeah, great. In interesting. That's, uh, that's yeah. something uh, um, I can use. Uh, there is a demand in the market for counterintelligence and uh, yeah as as a human you are let's say uh, you are intrigued to <laughs> use your skills and just reverse them to to use them in the counterintelligence uh, sphere that's it's basically the the same metal but different sides but um, there is there is a market for it i have clients who are in in yeah demand of this stuff and thank you very much for the yeah yeah for and, the book uh, that's great um because like i think people ask me all the time to to mention uh, books and and, uh, and stuff I'm watching right now I, I I'm not watching anything because I don't have much time but the one book that I just finished is uh, it's an older one but it's uh, Black Ops by Rick Prado okay uh, it's more about his life um, at the CIA Special Activities Division uh, center but he's going to be on the podcast so oh, great uh, yeah so uh so I wanted to know more about about him. So I try to read every book of guests that are gonna that are gonna come. So it keeps me cool. sharp doing that. Um, yeah. Any last remarks? Any comments from you, Crystal? Again, thank you very much for for uh, giving me the the chance to to talk to you and uh, to spread some of my ideas and maybe some of my more useful experiences. One maybe one thing. Um, I want to to emphasize uh, usually intelligence or the intelligence uh, sphere, uh, especially in the news when they do something bad or do something wrong or something like this. 
And that's something I have to, I, I want to, to point out that in my time in, in German intelligence, but also in working with, with the foreign partners, they are just normal people that are, work, that are working there. And I, I had the privilege and the luck that I had never encountered uh, really, really bad people who, let's say, misused their special authority or their special powers in, in doing their work. And therefore, um, that's the one thing I, I tell everyone who, who's listening or who's not listening, that um, even spies or intelligence individuals, uh, they are only just normal humans and they are not per se bad. And they, they, they don't want to know their sec your secrets uh, all the day and all the night. They are just normal people doing a job and uh, uh, they are usually very, very aware what they can do and what they can which effects they can create and they are very responsible in, in using this kind of stuff and uh, maybe to end with this sentence one of my my biggest let's say end bosses in when i want to do something was actually my my head of of intelligence collection when i want to do some some special spy stuff i had to justify and i had to to speak for it and prove it um, why i want to choose a specific let's say and intelligence uh, method to achieve something and he was he was the hardest opponent he was the guy who was in the end signing it off but he was also the hardest opponent and uh, that was a privilege to to know someone like this so so liberal and so aware of our freedoms in in the west so please don't don't look at every spy that he's someone who intends to break the law or make your life complicated that's that's something i try to Bring out great all the time. No, great, great point. No, I I uh, I, uh, I second this, and um, it it gets the 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 industry and the job gets a bad reputation because it's an easy target because they cannot really respond um, due to the nature of on the work. But no, I I I agree with you, and um, I want to thank you, Christoph. It was really a pleasure. Always, when I talk to you, it's a pleasure, and I and I and I feel I learned something new. And for everybody that's that's listening in, is there anywhere we should add they can find you? They can reach yeah, out to you. Please, yeah, please, of course. Um, take take my LinkedIn, uh, my LinkedIn profile, um, uh, Christoph Stegemann. There you can find me. Uh, my my little small company is called Words Well Used. It's a it's a nice German English mesh up word. Um, if you if you put this in, you can find me. And uh, as a former and still active operator in some areas, yeah, you you try to minimize your social media footprint. Therefore, those uh, are the places to look for. For sure, awesome. Thank you, Christoph, again, and uh, for everybody else that's um, that's listening. And if you made it this far, thank you so much for the support. And uh, and I and I read every comment. I read every message. So uh, I really appreciate that. And I will see you guys in the next one. Thank you.